Our final speaker today is Dr. Louise Barrett. And Dr. Barrett was trained in ecology and anthropology at the University College London and has taught in anthropology, biology, and psychology departments in the UK and Canada. She's currently a professor of psychology and a Canada research chair in cognition, evolution, and behavior at the University of Lethbridge and a fellow of the Royal Society of Canada. Over the past 25 years, she's conducted long-term field studies of baboons and vervet monkeys in South Africa in collaboration with Professor Peter Henze. Her research centers on how ecology shapes the patterns of socially, or, so, or socially, oh, I said that word wrong, I'm sorry, brain size and cognitive evolution. She's also interested in a biocultural approach to human behavior, particularly with the respect to fertility and reproductive decision making in both non industrial and industrial societies. Her work draws on the disciplines of anthropology, psychology, philosophy, cognitive science, and behavioral ecology. And uh, Dr. Uh, Barrett's last lecture titled is The Parable of Cliff's Jolly Chimney. Louise, thank you for being here today and I look forward to your talk. Thank you. Okay, um, I'm going to share my screen because after a semester I really do not want to uh, look at myself anymore. Um, <laughs> so this is hopefully going to work. Let me just... Um, Hopefully you can see that all right. Um, so yes, thank you so much for the invitation and for setting everything up. It's all gone so smoothly. It's really lovely to be here. It's been a lovely afternoon as we celebrate everyone's graduation and their success. Um, I did something like this once before about 10 or 11 years ago and I went on about my deep and abiding love for Dolly Parton. Um, so it's good to see that the world has come to a broader appreciation of Dolly in the intervening years as well. And um, I think I also said that the only advice I was prepared to give was that everything tastes better if you put bacon on it. And uh, I still stand by that. So I haven't changed that much. So yeah, my talk is titled The Parable of Cliff Jolly's Chimney. And I, I want to offer this story up as a way to think about what's unexpected about unexpected journeys. Um, or perhaps it might make more sense to say, perhaps all journeys are unexpected and to consider this story and some other stories that, that will help to illustrate that point. Um, so this is Cliff, uh, Cliff Jolly. He's a world-renowned expert on baboon evolution and genetics. Um, he um, is one of my long-standing academic heroes. This is quite an old photograph. He's a very eminent professor now. He won a Charles Darwin Award a few years ago, which I think is probably the top award you can get if you're an evolutionary biologist. And um, you know they always say, oh, you shouldn't meet your heroes. But in this case, it was well worth it. He's a wonderfully funny, kind, and really generous person. And um, some of Cliff's work concerns how we can use baboons, which is one of the species I've studied um, in my career, to help us understand human evolution. Um, as the modern baboons, the Papio baboons, as they're known, evolved during the same period that our own species evolved. So we have very detailed data on baboon behavior, genetics, um, and how different species are distributed across Africa, um, in time and space across their evolution, which is um, what we would call phylogeography. Um, so comparing how the different baboon allotaxa, as they're called, evolved over space and time, allows us to perhaps understand a little bit more how our early ancestors um, also evolved over space and time, but where we don't have such good data on genetics and very little, you know, there's nothing on behavior and there's much less in the way of phy phylogeography. So this was sort of, this is sort of where Cliff, the, 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 the um, area Cliff is interested in, but he's always very careful to say, well, we need a certain amount of caution here. And, and this is where his chimney comes in. So I was, um, here's Cliff again, and I was at a conference and Cliff gave a talk and he told this story about how he'd recently had his chimney relined. And looking down um, the chimney from the roof, his builder was, you know, really chuffed that he'd done this, um, you know, really amazing and excellent job. Um, um, and oops, I've gone too far. Um, and uh, you know, the, as he looked down the chimney from the top, the lining looked smooth and perfect. Um, but then Cliff lit a fire later that day, and as soon as he did, the smoke began billowing out of all the fireplaces in his house, all over the place. It was like a mass panic, and the fire had to be fired extremely speedily. And when everything had calmed down. Cliff took a look up the chimney from the bottom and he could immediately see that all the lining plates had been fitted upside down 
and they were leaving these gaps through which all the smoke come out and these were just not visible when he'd been looking um, when the builder had been looking down from above so cliff used this terribly sad story of how his home improvements had completely failed to improve anything to draw an analogy with how we look at evolution so when we stand in the present and sort of look down the chimney of evolution we similarly similarly see um, fail to see the gaps we just see this smooth unbroken line that leads straight from each species to the next from one ancestor to the next where one change leads neatly to another and it's only if you can look up the chimney if you can look from from um towards the present from the past if you look from the bottom up can you see the complexity of the true picture so once you do that you see a much more convoluted um, pattern of of baboon evolution and that's something that's even more true for our own species um, there's a why you know the, you, you only when you really look from the bottom up can you see the variety of different evolutionary paths taken all the lines that went extinct the chance events that shed that pushed particular lineages in, in particular directions um, it's really messy it's really contingent and all of that gets lost if we just take ourselves and then just look for the next ancestor down, the next ancestor down, the next ancestor down. So I think this is really useful in my work as, a, as a, someone who's interested in baboon evolution. But I think the same is also true when people get asked to tell tales of their own personal evolution and, and uh, through their lives, that it's really easy to smooth it all out, to leave out the messy chance events and you know to make it seem as though it was a, a, a tidy story of how hard work and grit and talent can explain all the things that, that, that went on in their lives and you know, large dollops of luck and, and the chance events get left out. Um, and I think also the other way, you can look at it the other way that if you take a very top down view, you can imbue certain chance events with huge amounts of significance so that they seem to become really pivotal and the moment that changed your life. But it may only be because you look you're, we're, you know, you're looking down on a smoothed out trajectory and the bumpy reality with lots of insignificant chance events has, has been forgotten. So in this sense, I think we all undergo unexpected journeys and it can be good to be aware that in certain circumstances, the story may have been told from the top of the chimney rather than the bottom. So in my own case, I can tell a nice neat story where I studied science at school, I found I had an aptitude, I went to university to study ecology, I was able to study primate behaviour as an undergraduate, from there I moved on to do a PhD um, in primate ecology, working on great cheek mangabees in Uganda, following that, you know, that led me into a faculty position and I was from there able to start my own field site on baboons and continue my, you know, and, and test my ideas there and, you know, emphasising hard work and determination and all the things that got there. But I can also tell, uh, so, you know, um, if I think, put myself back in, in, you know, what was happening in my life, I can tell a, a more accurate, more messy bottom up story where I just didn't really have a clue what I was doing. I am um, the first person in my family to go to university. I didn't really know, um, you know, how to go about that or even what a university really was. My chemistry teacher just suggested to my mum and dad at a parents evening that I might enjoy it and that I should do A-levels. Um, which are the exams you need to go to university in the UK because most people in my school left school at the age of 16. I was one of only two people who went to university in, in my entire year. I had to go and do my A-levels at uh, four different schools because there weren't enough people at my school to um, justify doing the courses I wanted to do. Um, so I didn't know whether to do standard science subjects like biology, physics and chemistry or go for more social science, humanities subjects like history, geography and English, which are the sort of standard things that get put together, you know, because I liked both. Um, so I ended up doing biology, chemistry and geography, um, purely because there was a field trip to the west of Ireland if you did geography, which sounded like a free holiday to me. So I chose that and um, that was a mistake. I've never worked so hard in my life. Uh, and I chose my university not as the best place to get a degree in the particular subject that I was that I was applying for but because when I went for an interview UCL offered me a chocolate biscuit when they when I when um before I went in to see the tutor and nowhere else did that and I thought well this is a great place chocolate biscuits um after I graduated I worked in the library at King's College London for a year um which was which was useful um, I learned how to use a library very well and I also learned that you should never be rude to a library assistant um because now I know how to take excellent revenge. So I'm always very, very, very um, 
uh, respectful of anyone who works in a library. Um, and then I contacted my old primate, primate ecology lecturer because I just thought, well, libraries, working in libraries is not for me long term. Um, and I just asked him if he knew of anyone who wanted a field assistant, because I thought, well, maybe if I get some field experience, that would be a way into a different kind of life. And as luck would have it, he was looking for a PhD student. And because it was the, the end of the 80s, it was like 1989, 1990 when I graduated. Everybody was leaving um, university and immediately going to the work in the city, like in the financial um, sector, making fortune, good paying jobs in other areas were also very easy to come by and fewer people wanted to do PhDs. And as a consequence, I was able to get full funding for my PhD, which was, I would never have been able to do it if I'd had to rely on my own resources or my parents, because we just didn't have, we just, I just didn't come from a background with that sort of um, wherewithal. So I was just hugely lucky. Um, and again, you know, when I finished my PhD, my supervisor was contacted by someone to ask if he wanted to collaborate on starting a new field site. And he didn't want to do so. He, he didn't want to go to do any more field work. And he just said, would you like to take up the offer instead? You know, this person wants to do something in South Africa. Would you like to join them? And that was just pure luck as well. So, you know, cluelessness and luck play a much larger role in my story and merit accounts for much less. And, you know, I'm only speaking for myself here. Other people's stories can and do reflect their determination and their vision and their talent. And I think what I'm really saying here is, um, you know, the old saying is that comparison is the thief of joy. And so it's just to remember that when we compare ourselves to others, we're inevitably going to do so often from the, from the top of the chimney looking down. And we're gonna miss out so many details of other people's lives and their own because the, the, there's a tendency to, to smooth things out and tell a nice reflective chimney-based story. So I think for that reason, I'm very um, a very big fan of this documentary series, Seven Up, which I, I don't know if any of you've seen it. I think you can get it on Netflix and I think it's on Amazon, but anyway, it's, it's widely available now, I think, for in streaming platforms. Um, and I often use this in my teaching. Um, so in 1964, the director, Michael Apted, is the man in the middle there. He made this documentary, and he was only about 23 himself when he made it, where he interviewed 14 British seven-year-olds from a variety of, of backgrounds, like different class backgrounds in the UK about their lives. And the whole point was like, give me the child until he's seven and I will give you the man. And it's like, you know, can we, can we map out these children's futures when you're just talking to them? A seven-year-olds will we understand something about how your life at seven um, influences what's going to happen to you and so it was about the class structure in, in the UK really but then he went back again seven years later to talk to them when they were 14 and again seven years after that and he's been doing he, he's been doing it every seven years since so the most recent um, episode most recent set of documentaries was uh, 63 up um, which may sadly be the last, I think, because very sadly, Michael Apted died in January of this year, aged um, 79. Um, so these films are fascinating for all sorts of reasons, but one of the reasons I like them is because they can't, people can't impose this neat top, you know, view from the top of the chimney narrative on their lives as they reflect back, um, because They've been, you know, they've not been filmed at adult, as adults only and asked to talk about their childhood. The evidence from the previous seven years and the years before that and the years before that is always there. And so you see, you're kind of, you see their lives going forwards rather than, than a simple reflecting backwards. So as a result, you can see how people do really change. So this woman, her name is Susie. She was a very posh little girl who was in ballet in the first um, uh, documentary when she was seven. And when she's 21, she's very grumpy and sulky and doesn't really want to, to take part. And she declares she will never get married. And then she, they ask if she would like children. And she's like, no, I don't like babies. And then the next seven years later, they go back and the episode opens, you know, and there she is. She's married. She has two children. She's, she's clearly delights in her new family. Um, you know, and, and you wouldn't see that necessarily if you ask someone to reflect that, because I think we change our stories to suit our circumstances. And um, the other nice thing is to see the tables get turned as the grown up kids start objecting to the stories that Michael Apted is telling about them and how they see their own life story differently from the way he does. So this woman, Jackie, is very, you know, she's excellent. She's very um, 
precocious as a seven-year-old and she is one of the feistiest uh, people in it, certainly the feistiest woman. And she starts saying to Michael, Dad, you used to ask us all these kind of sexist questions and you used to ask us things that you would never ask the boys in this documentary. And he's like, whoa. So, you know, that, the, the, the subjects of the documentary start objecting to how they're depicted. So I think, you know, hats off to, to Michael Apted because this whole UP series is a tribute to the value of looking up from the bottom of the chimney. Um, and when I've used this in class, the, my students have usually said one or two things, like it's okay. This, this series made me realize it's okay to have a normal boring life. Like everyone's life is interesting. And I thought that because they're so used to seeing reality television series about celebrities or you know people on Survivor and all these things where people are placed into adversity, um, you know, artificially. And it's like, life is hard enough and people's stories and how they overcome the particular challenges they face just in, in their real, in everyday real life are, are inspiring and interesting enough. And then the second thing people say is like, I didn't realize people would change so much and carry on changing as they get older, that people's, you know, most people don't seem to get stuck in their ways. So um, I think that, you know, rather than reflecting on things from the top of, of we, uh, and how we've lived our lives, these kind of bottom up things allow us to recognize how much we change, how often we deceive ourselves about, about our lives and what, how they turned out um, and, and the sort of the significance of the decisions that we make. And here we can turn to um, the pro poet Robert Frost, I think, because his poem, The Road Not Taken, is usually presented as an illustration of how choosing you know, the harder or less well-trodden of two alternatives can be the making of us. And there's always this emphasis on these last lines here, two roads diverge in the wood and I, I took the one less traveled by, and that has made all the difference. Um, now, I'm a big proponent of the idea that all readings are valid and you can take away from a poem what you like. And if you want to sit to say that and say, yes, I made this decision and this decision changed my life because I, I did the alternative thing that I you know, wasn't really set up to do, that's brilliant. But if you read the whole thing, um, you realize there's a sort of, you know, that, that Frost is doing something really, you know, cheeky and clever and, and, and there's a certain irony to it. And because and, earlier in the poem, he says that the roads that he had to choose between were really about the same. And both that morning equally lay in leaves, no step had trod in black. So in other words, there is no less traveled road in this, in this poem and they are in fact interchangeable in which case it probably makes no difference which road was taken. Um, and indeed that's something you can never actually know because you, he only ever goes down one road and we have no clue whether or not it made a difference at all. You can't actually make that, that um, uh, assumption or you can't come to that conclusion. So this poem is really you know, fantastic because it's a commentary on the kinds of myths we can often create about ourselves. Um, when we assume it's our own choices that get us where we are, when in fact many things could either have just turned out more or less the same and there aren't any momentous single choices which sort of is a is a comforting thing to think about you know you don't have to to treat everything as though it's momentous and it may have um major consequences you can just have a go and see how how things turn out so i'd like to pretend that this revelation came about for me reading you know robert frost but in fact it was the baboons who started me thinking along those lines. It was much later that I came across Robert Frost's poem and went, ah, oh, this sort of gets at what I, you know, the, what the baboon thing with me and Parry. So we were doing this one study um, where we were using GPS points to map the positions of all the baboons in the group. So um, as you can see, sometimes the baboons are very, very spread out. There's one right over there. Um, sometimes they, they cluster together. And so we had GPS that we, and the baboons are very well habituated. So we could record their position using a GPS point. So I was collecting data with our postdoc at the time, Parry Clark, this is Parry. Um, we would begin at opposite ends of the troop and we would get a GPA, uh, GPS point for the adult baboons as many times as we could as they traveled over the landscape during the day. And hopefully you can see this. So this is the, the, the end point. This is an analysis done by Marcus Gosky, who's in geography at UofL, who's doing a PhD with us. Um, and so, and this is very, very speeded up. If they went that fast, I certainly wouldn't be following them around with the GPS. Um, this is a whole day compressed into like, you know, uh, a minute. So sometimes the baboons would just meander around in the same area. Sometimes they would go for a march across the, you know, the felt and with what seemed like purpose in mind. 
Um, and, uh, you know, on occasion, something would happen. There'd be another baboon group in the distance, a tour, you know, it's a tourist it was a reserve where tourists could come, so a tourist vehicle would drive past. And the baboons would then deviate from the, the trajectory that they seem to be on. And this would infuriate Parry. He would rant about the tourists and the other baboons for making our baboons go the wrong way. And we would spend ages worrying about when our baboons would like, when are they going to get back on track? When are they going to be able to get back on their preferred route? When are they going to be able to, you know, so they can reach their goal, you know, whatever that is, you know, how are they going to be able to sort of rectify this mistake? And then one day, for reasons that I really, you know, can't explain, we both had this realization at the same time, um, that there was no track to get back on. The baboons hadn't been forced off course by the disturbances they experienced, because the course they were on was really only in my head and Parry's head. And it clearly wasn't in the baboon's head at all. They didn't have a goal, um, you know, in mind in, in that way. Um, their marches across the landscape most likely re reflected the weather conditions. If it was cold, they would move more quickly with, you know, with greater speed. Um, the distribution of food required them to keep going <clears throat> and would pull them through as they were, if they were eating small things that were very evenly distributed, they would just keep going in a very quick straight line because that was the best, most efficient way to, to acquire those food resources. So the changes in direction that they experienced weren't deviations or detours. Um, there were no alternative routes or less traveled roads. They were just the baboons taking whatever road there was to take in the moment and just not caring how well traveled it was or not. So to use the writer George Saunders's formulation in this really lovely book that um, I just finished reading, you can say that the baboons had a narrative, you know, events were happening one after the other, but the baboons don't have a story. There wasn't a moment of change in which they saw events anew or experienced a shift in perspective. Um, that story belongs to me and Parry. Events took place and there was a moment of change and we realized that error and things are different. Like we can make, I can make that into a story for you, but the baboons didn't have a story. And the story that, that we saw really wasn't there. And I think that's what characterizes the difference in, in part between humans and other primates. So both humans and non-human primates, we're excellent pattern recognizers. We have large brains that help us pick up all the regularities and relationships between various things in the world. But it appears that humans um, have the ability to impose patterns of our own design on the world. So we can take lots of disparate information that we learn at different times and we shape them into narratives and stories, whether informally in terms of the stories we tell about our lives to ourselves and others, and also obviously formally when we write stories, whether these are fiction or non-fiction. So the ability to impose pattern can be highly beneficial and a lot of our ability to, you know, our ability to um, design things and imagine other worlds and then bring them into being, you know, that's the, that's, that's the sort of summary of, of humans' immense cultural capacity. It's why we can sit here using Zoom to, to, um, con to talk to each other during this terrible pandemic. But, um, and just to digress a tiny amount, the ability to impose pattern um, can mislead us when we try to understand the world of other animals. And so part of what I teach is how we have to be careful that we don't impose um, our stories on other species and only see them in, in human terms. So our ability to recognize and create patterns um, is what allows us to cope flexibly with whatever life throws at us, which makes sense because we're a long-lived, slowly developing primate who live, who live in dynamic, changeable environments. You know, these environments are also often changed by our own actions. So when it comes to unexpected journeys, you know, all I can, you know, the only sort of vague advice I would say, and it's a huge cliche, is that we have to expect the unexpected. And we are built to expect the unexpected and deal with it effectively. That's the human adaptation. And this plus Cliff's chimney story, I think, has been very useful for me in helping me keep, keep things in perspective. So this being the case, and if all we can really do is expect the unexpected, um, then as you go forward beyond graduation, is there any way to know when, you know, you're, I mean, when you're getting near your goals or whether your plans are working out or not? And to answer this, I can only say, who knows? You know, we're at the bottom of the chimney. We're looking up. Um, 
But I would also, you know, to end on a slightly more optimistic note, I will first refer you to um, the writer and activist Rebecca Solnit. And this goes back to what Brendan was saying, I think, where you know, she says this great thing about whatever you do, whatever change you try to make, even if it seems small and, and insignificant, she says, it's always too soon to go home and it's always too soon to calculate effect. And I think that's very powerful. And the second thing I would say is, um, comes to you from uh, Mark Kermode, who is a British film reviewer um, who, run, who does a podcast. And he offers this uh, following wisdom, which I've also seen now that has been attributed to John Lennon and um, also Ed Sheeran of all people. Um, but I heard it from Mark Kermode first, so I'm going to stick with him. And what he says is, it will all be all right in the end. And if it's not all right, then it's not the end. Um, congratulations on your graduation and thank you for listening. There we go. Sorry, Dr. Barrett. <laughs> I, um, I got kicked out of the Zoom meeting and I've been kicked out of a lot of places, but this one was one of the places I didn't want to get kicked out of. So it was a bit of a mad scramble behind the scenes and now I've, I'm hooked up on my phone. So I hope that you can hear me okay. And uh, yeah, because you know the Zoom thing, you get kicked out of Zoom, you don't get to come back. <laughs> right. No, that's okay. <laughs> Right. Which is good, I guess, when you're teaching classes and you get Zoom bombed by somebody that you kick them out, they can't make their way back. But so we were able to, uh, to get I things connected. What were you doing, Jason? What were you doing? Why are you being naughty? Did Liam have to get rid of you? For... <laughs> <laughs> I just, I don't know. I just, periodically, I, I overstep my bounds. I've been known to do that in my life. Um, so I, I caught the tail end of your, um, your speech there. And so I do have a couple of questions, though, um, from um, here. And I will try my best to navigate this on my phone. So forgive me if this is, seems a little bit socially awkward, but how do you think baboons, I really love this question, by the way, how do you think baboons see their own lives? And is that something that we can ever really know? Yeah, I was just saying, this is all like fitting with, this is like fitting with the theme of this, uh, the unexpected journey, even you're having an unexpected journey. Now. Yeah. Oh yeah, definitely. Um, so yeah, I, I, I think that baboons don't have the same notion of time as we do. I think they see things as things happen and, you know, they're in the moment and they don't necessarily, you know, if you're here, you're here. And it's, I think it's very out, uh, out of time, out of mind, out, you know, um, out of sight, out of mind. So we had one instance where this male um, left the group and he, you know, they might, they move, males, move between groups as they reach adulthood and females stay in the same troop all their lives. And this male went away to join another troop, but he then came back again. And he had been very chummy with this juvenile baboon um, while he was in our troop. And, you know, when he left, there was like, the juvenile just was like, oh, well, he's not here now. There was no sort of response. And then about six or seven months later, he just walked back into the troop and the baby, you know, the juvenile baboon just went over and started grooming him again as though, as though it was, the same day that he left you know as though, as though nothing had had changed and so I think that that they they just have this different sense of time and they're not putting things together in these joined up ways in which we do and I think probably that's really good because you know baboon's life they often at our site you know they get up in the morning and then they go to this lake bed and they dig up muddy roots all day and eat them and if you knew that was your life and you were going to have to do it again tomorrow and the day after that and the day after that I think it would be terrible so I hope they don't I think I really hope they. I mean now we all know that feeling don't we because of now the Covid times it's like it's awful to just think oh my goodness this day is going to be exactly like the last day and the next day so um yeah I think I think from what I I gather the baboons have a different view of of time and they they don't they really live in the moment. Um, and I don't know if we can ever really get inside the baboon's head. Um, and I think it would be a mistake to try and do so if we're just going to try and make them very like humans. So, I mean, that's, that's a, big, a big topic there. But um, yeah, I think that just trying to see the world from their perspective is really interesting because it's more interesting than trying to think from our own perspective, because when you look at it from their perspective and realize how 
different their lives are. Like they don't have times of day, they don't have clock time, they don't have a calendar. You kind of realize how regimented our days are. You know, it really helps you see the difference between us and other species. So I think that's a really helpful thing is to is to keep the distinctiveness there and understand that we are primates, but we're very, we are very different ones. And what those differences come about in these very cultural ways is is an interesting um, you know perspective that I like to have. But whether we'll really understand the baboon's mind, I don't think. Well, it's interesting and you're absolutely right about COVID time because I often find um, myself unaware of what day it is or what week it was or I had a meeting three weeks ago. Was that a month ago? I don't know. Right. Yeah, and so, that means nothing. Yeah. And I think so now we're all we're all becoming more baboon like. Maybe, you know, maybe we will understand the baboon a bit more now. Maybe <laughs> there might be some rooting for roots in my life. I don't yeah. know. We'll have to see what happens. So <laughs> you can ask another question here, and then I, I'm just sort of keeping my eye on the time as well. Um, it seems as though you're saying that we end up telling ourselves stories about our lives that may or may not quite be true and that we should be aware of that. But is the fact that we construct these stories about ourselves something that helps us out psychologically? Um, I think it does. I think the fact that if we can tell ourselves a story that helps make sense of what's going on, I, I think that we like to have that sense of coherence. And I think it does help us put together plans for how we come to that and i think it goes back to that question about did you have a sense of self i think that's how we generate our certain sense of self in a way is by telling a particular story of ourselves about ourselves to ourselves and we construct ourselves narratively in that way i think the thing that's that that needs to be kept in mind is that then you become that kind of person you say well i'm not the kind of person who would do that you know oh, i'm not the kind of person who would do that so brendan's story is great because He's like, and then I did this, and then I did this. You know, it's very difficult to say he's not the kind of person who would do that. So I think the thing to remember is it, it helps to give you a sense of coherence and purpose and a sense of self in those positive ways. But I think it also can be a trap if you just then become, if you believe your own story too much. And the thing to do is to recognize that that's what you're doing. And you can yeah. always change. You can always change your story because it is just a story. Well, it's interesting because I've taught English for a long time and I teach drama as well. And it's all about story, right? And the stories that we learn and stories that we study, we study the stories that we know and, and say about ourselves. And yeah. we've heard lots of stories today. And I often ask my students, and I noticed, I think in the chat that I have a former student in with this last lecture today, Amber. Um, and I always say to them, you know, whose story is being told at this moment? Yeah. But mostly whose story is not being told? And that's always an interesting aspect. And so sometimes, you know, as we tell ourselves these stories of our lives, um, whose stories, as we tell our own stories, are we not telling in the same respect of those stories as well? So I'm um, not to get too deep on you right now, but. Uh... No, that's really good. I think there's a, there's a novelist, um, uh, Chimamanda Ngochi Adichie, and she always says there's a danger in having a single story, that that's the problem. Mm. Like, then you never have the full story being told because you're not getting everybody's voice and there's a big danger to only having a single story. So what you're saying fits perfectly with that. Yeah, and I think too, if I've, having listened to uh, all of these fantastic lectures today, yeah. um, the plans that we have and where we end up are <laughs> two completely different places. And I remember watching this TED talk when I did my master's and um, she always, it was this one about uh, this idea of being wrong in that we had these sort of plans but then life made us do something else. And uh, how we get there is, is really interesting. So, so there we go. Um, I'm just noticing the time and I, I think that uh, we've, we've filled in this part. I wanna make sure that we can you know, move on with the stories of our lives and not <laughs> be here all day. So I'm gonna wrap it up and thank you for your time. And I'm sorry I missed part of your, uh, your lecture, but I know that it was recorded. So I think that we'd be able to access this um, recording at some point. Uh, I think it'll probably be up. I'm making an assumption it might be on the website, but uh, I don't know. I might've just created a bunch of work for some folks in the office. So, you know, and as president of the ATA, I do that all the time. Yeah, they, they should, yeah. Well, probably they deserve it for throwing you out of the meeting. <laughs> I've been kicked out of worse places, I guess. I don't know. We'll have to see. Um, but thank you very much. And, uh, and I hope that you enjoy um, the rest of your day. And please stay safe.